tonight, brother. All right. So last time I was here, I didn't turn this thing on the whole time. I didn't know it until it was over. Um, I've, I've grown to stand behind the thing. Is that okay? <clears throat> so sometimes you just you change as a preacher, I guess. I used to roam a little bit, and now I'm more of a hold on to this thing for dear life kind of guy. And so... All right, good evening, good evening, hello. I came in here and I sat down and I uh, was trying to think about what I needed to do and, and pray a little bit and uh, it's just good to just breathe and say hello. Hope everybody's doing all right. It's good to be with you. Thank you for letting me be with you. Um, it's always a blessing uh, to get to be with you. I love you. I love many of you very deeply and that means that I know some of you more than others is all that that means. I love you all, but some of you I really, really know and I'm thankful uh, for you. And so I appreciate this congregation so much. Um, you've been good to me. Um, I really like the local flavor that you added to the summer series. So that's cool. Um, I was looking and I saw friends and ministers that I love, like Doyle and Rich and Matt, and next week, Andrew. Uh, I, I've been uh, in Sumner County for my whole life. I guess I started ministering uh, here for, uh, as a job in 2009, and I'll tell you that we as Sumner County ministers, I think, are closer than we've ever been, and so that's cool. I've wanted that for a long time. We, we love each other, and I love Sean dearly, and I love Sam dearly, and, um, and so uh, it's good to be a part of that, of that group of guys. It's good to serve this community with those guys. Now, the last time I spoke to an assembly, uh, the last time I spoke to an assembly was four weeks ago in this room. Um, I've been on a break. I've been taking a rest from teaching, and uh, I have not shaved. And so um, I know you have bearded preachers here, although I heard uh, uh, Sean has shaved his beard. That's a bummer. I like that beard. Um, but uh, I've been on a little break. I've been taking a little rest. Uh, my break was pre-planned. Um, everything's okay. I was thankful. I am thankful for Old Union for letting me just kind of take some time um, I felt myself getting tired. I felt myself getting frustrated. Um, I may be a little scattered tonight because uh, it's, it's meant a lot to me uh, preaching the past year and a half, and it was needed to just kind of to take, a, take a break for a minute. And so I hope all this will make sense tonight. The topic means a lot to me, uh, loving the community. Uh, it means so much to me that sometimes I think that I can do it better by not preaching in pulpits. I'll be honest with you. And so... Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to get to talk about it with you, but I'm talking about something that means a lot to me. Uh, the message had grown very heavy on my heart, uh, heavier than I ever recall it growing. Um, I don't ask for sympathy. I don't. Um, our job isn't as hard as many of the jobs that some of y'all do in this room, but it has been tough the past year and a half trying to preach through all this stuff, you know, and uh, preaching to empty rooms and preaching to a lot of divided people. Um, and so, um, so be prayerful for those who have attempted to do it. Um, I don't know if I feel better after taking a break, uh, but the time away has been good. Let me put it that way. <laughs> the time away has been good. And so um, what I thought would be a rest turned into me testing positive for COVID and being quarantined for a while. And uh, about 20 others from Old Union tested positive with me. And so we stopped our in-person services about three weeks ago. So it's good timing, I guess, right? I'm out of the pulpit. We're not meeting anyway. Um, you can laugh if you want. I mean that to be somewhat facetious. But I'm also hurting on the inside because a lot of our people are hurting. Um, we have a, a lady right now that's, that's hospitalized. She's a dear friend of mine. She's my office helper. She's kind of like my Zella, Miss Zella. And, uh, and so I'll ask you to be prayerful for Old Union and be prayerful for her. Her name's Miss Patricia. Um, and so as I was thinking, that, that, that probably has influenced what I'm going to say to you tonight quite a bit. While I was thinking about what to say, I was thinking about how prayer, listen now, tune in, prayer may be the best way for you to be or become the lesson that you've asked me to bring tonight. I'm going to say that one more time, okay? Prayer may be the best way for you to be or to become the lesson that I was asked to present. The lesson being how to love your community as a congregation. Okay, I think Matt Miller tried to indicate how we should love our community as individuals. 
my, my topic is how do we love as a congregation. I'm going to submit to you that by praying for your community may be the very best way. And maybe you've heard 100 million lessons on prayer, and so you've already tuned out and said he's going to just give us a lesson on prayer. This isn't a lesson that I've given before. I never do that. This is one that I mean for us as a people. And I say us because I mean it for me. Old Union doesn't have this figured out. I love it, and I think we're doing a good job, and we're doing hard things, but I don't come to you as one that has this figured out. I'm not the authority on how to love your community by praying for them, but I, but I want to be good at it, and I want to be intentional about it. And if we're going to wear the name of Jesus Christ on our sign in this community, then I want us as a body of people to do this, to be very intentional about how we care for and how we pray for our community. Sometimes I get worked up about stuff, and I don't mean to in a way that sounds negative. I don't. I don't. I love you, and I love this mission, and I love our King, and I love our God, and I want us to pursue Him with all of our heart. And so here's what I wanted to say. Do, do, you, think, do you think that there's room for Portland Church of Christ to love the community better than you already do? You can interact with me a little bit. Do, do, do you think that you do that great? Because if you do that great, then, then I need to sit down. Y'all need to tell me how to do that. All right? And I mean that. I, I would sit down. I remember I'm on break. And so. <laughs> but if there's room for you as a congregation to love this community better, then can you please not expect me to just come in here and tickle your ears tonight? Do you know what I mean by that? If you, if you admit that there's room for us to do this better, then is it okay if I don't just tickle your ears tonight? You know what I mean by that, right? Can we be challenging? Can I, can I present a message that's challenging and not be called negative or angry? Can I? Can we talk about this for real? Okay? So, um, initially, I didn't think I'd talk about prayer tonight. Um, my mind was initially drawn to us making much of God. I say that all the time, okay? This has become kind of foundational to, to, to my ministry, for us to make much of God, to make much of God, okay, to magnify his greatness um, as a congregation to make much of God. So why did I want to start there? Why, why do I want to start there with you? Because I think God's primary desire is to share himself with others. Now listen to me, please. One more time, God's primary desire in creating humans was to share himself with us, to share his goodness and his greatness with us. Got a a row full of young people here, okay? Grew up in the church, didn't mean, I I didn't know deep, important things about God, probably well into my 20s, I didn't. And so I plead with young people to, to challenge yourself to know these very deep and important things of God. Why did God make you? What's the, what's his purpose in making you? What is all this about? I have come to believe, church, and this helps me theologically, millennial people like me or whatever generation we are, this helps me theologically to understand why God made us. It helps me. Okay? He made us because he's awesome and he wants to share himself with us. That's it. He he is not about being selfish. He is so good that he just wants to share himself. He just wants you to know him and love him. And bring him glory. There's a, a preacher that I like who says that he is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. Stop that. Re- rewind. Think. Like, now, 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 he's going to be glorified. He is right to be glorified. He is right to be glorified. Okay? But he is most glorified when we are most fulfilled and most satisfied in him. He's that good, y'all. He's that good. And so it's, it's good and it's great. It's, it is awesome for me to say, God, from you and through you and to you are all things. To you be glory forever and ever. Amen. Therefore, what is left for me to do but to submit myself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, to lay everything I got down and give it all to him. Why? Because he's that good. From him, through him, and to him. He's that good. All he wants to do is share himself with you. That's it. And that's good. And that's great. Take that with you. Forever. <laughs> So that's where I wanted to start, and, and as a preacher, it's time to insert a proof text. You might think, well, Stephen, that's a lot of you talking. Give me a proof text. Here's your proof text. Start in Genesis 1, verse 1, and read through Revelation 22, verse 21, and there's your proof text. The whole story, all of it, is about God just wanting to share himself with you. 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 
He wants you. The, the creator of heaven and earth from Psalm 24 just wants to hang out with you. Yeah. Changes everything for me. And so, do you see how this now connects to when I give myself to him, when I seek him and follow him? What do I want to do? You see, my desires become his desires. All I want to do is share him with, with everybody. I want to share him with my community. I can't help but talk about him. Right? I can't help it. You, if you're, if you're going to hang out with me for any stretch of time at all, we're going to talk about God. Right? Right, little one? We are. Because he's everything. Everything. Do you, do you see this? And so, as a congregation, do you, do you want to love your community? Then listen to me now. You make everything, everything, everything you do about making much of God. Everything. I'm convinced that may not be popular church. There's a lot of popular church going on today. I'm convinced that may not be popular church. But I think it's the church of God to make much of Him. Y'all, y'all got a lot going on. I couldn't keep up with everything that was just said right there. That was a lot. I, I, I admire that. Sometimes I feel like we may not have a lot going on. Like, and, and then I'm tempted to just do and do and do and do, you know? Look, but the only way that every single thing that's announced from this microphone means anything, if it's all about making much of God. That's it. Those mash groups, guys, are awesome, but it's got to be about making much of God. Your youth group, it's got to be about making much of God. Social clubs gather and have fun things. You know what? There's a lot of back-to-school things you can go to. What's the difference in the church of Jesus Christ, though? We make much of God. We make much of the Savior, Jesus. He's our everything. I hope that makes some sense. And so that's where I really wanted to start, you know, a proof text, right? Uh, Insert. um, John, the apostle of Jesus, the one that he loved, said these words. You're probably familiar with them. We will love because what? Come on now. Because he first loved us. Do you see that? When we start to know his love for us, guess what we do? We start to love, guys. Um, This is probably, if you're taking some notes, this is probably one of Jesus' most profound teachings that has changed me, moved me, made me squirm or uncomfortable more than any other. And so what's going on is he and his disciples are reaching out to people that the world doesn't like, the religious leaders don't like, sinners and tax collectors, and they start confronting him about it, right? And Jesus then says this. Again, this one has made me squirm more than any other. He says, go and learn what this means. The Father desires mercy more than sacrifice. What's Jesus saying there? The God of heaven desires for for mercy to be shown to others, to the community. The God of heaven desires his love to be given out to others more than he just wants to sit and consume sacrifice for himself. Makes me squirm. This is the way of the God of heaven. This is what Jesus taught. All of his disciples indicated that in the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John just made it all about that. You know, loving. You want to love your community as a congregation then make everything you do about making much of God. Everything. Put it all out on the table. Lay it all out on the table. Is this about making much of God? Is this about seeking and knowing the greatness and glory and majesty of our God? Is this what it's about? So does that sound right? Am I on? Am, is, is, is God speaking there or am I is just... The selfish, fleshly Stephen speaking there. If, if, if I'm right there, then you might be tempted to do what I do. Like, when I hear something good, whether it's a youth ministry idea or whether whatever, when I hear something good, I usually want to get up and do something about it. So what are we going to do? Well, how, how, how are we going to make much of God? We're going to write down all of our ministries and then redo them, undo them, outdo them. Like, are we going to call a committee? All right. You, we're going to meet and figure out what we need to do. <laughs> what, what did I say the, the, the lesson became about as I studied and thought and contemplated and prayed. Ding, ding, ding. More than more. What's the, what's the first thing we're going to do if we maybe realize that, that maybe it could be more about God? What's the first thing we're going to do? Come on, y'all. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. We're going to pray about the hard things, the challenging things. 
the way to reach people. There's some obstacles in my heart to reaching people out there. There's some people I don't like. There's some ways that I don't like. There's some division in this room that I think is just hopeless. We're going to pray. We're going to pray hard. And we're going to pray a lot. That's what we're going to do. Okay? Um, so, if that's normal for you here, I'll sit down. <laughs> like, you know... But if that's not normal, if, if we've got room to pray more for our community, then let's consider this. We've made a lot about getting back to normal the past year and a half. It's kind of, can, can I be honest with you, it's kind of aggravated me a little bit. <laughs> like, there's some normal that I don't think we need to go back to. There's some things that I don't think we need to just jump back into. <laughs> you know what? Maybe there's some things we need to consider closely, like consider if, if they're really God-centered things. You know, may, maybe we, prayer is not the focus, not a chief characteristic of our congregation. If that's not the case, then let's consider that before we just jump back into our normal. Does that make sense? And so consider that with me. Okay, so all of that means nothing if it's not in the Bible, right? If it's not exampled in Scripture, um, I don't like to go back to the way things were, the normal that was, to figure out what we need to be doing now. I think a better practice is to go back to the early church, amen, and see what they were doing. So jump with me to Acts. We'll work through about four chapters in maybe 15 minutes or less. Um, and then we'll see, we'll, see, we'll see what comes of it. And so the early church, right, the early church. I uh, love Luke Acts. Man, um, we're working through Luke right now at Old Union. It's been hard. Increase our faith is what I keep coming to because when it gets hard, that's what I pray. Lord, this is hard stuff. Increase our faith. And so Luke Acts is great. Um, so, real, so, so real neat, the Bible's cool. This is the coolest book there is. We have the coolest book, the coolest Savior, the coolest God. I mean, there's nothing like this, guys, okay? You don't have to be weird. It's good to be a Bible weirdo. It's good, all right? It is. So, just, just look at your Bible and you'll see all kinds of amazing things. Like, Stephen, you said Luke Acts. Well, yeah, it's because Luke wrote both. And you got, like, volume one and volume two, and the Bible makes sense, and it's cool. And Luke says that. I mean, he says it in the first part of Acts. He, he describes Acts as everything that happens after the ascension of Jesus. And so, the gospel according to Luke is what Jesus began to teach, okay, so that's, that's the account of that, Luke, the gospel according to Luke. But then the ascension of Jesus takes place, and now it's the acts of the apostles. This is, it makes sense. It's, it's, not, it's a big book, but it's not a, always a confusing book. It's really not. Okay? And so that's, that's what I see here. Um, I love how Acts starts. Okay? Um, he, he refers, look, look in verse 2. <clears throat> he refers to... When he, you see this, was that me? I'm sorry. When he, by the Holy Spirit, gave orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Okay, so let's, let's pick up at where Jesus gave orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. And this becomes the book of Acts. What orders? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make all this connect with you tonight. What orders? The orders were all about loving the community, if you will and loving the community by fulfilling the commission to the community. Do you see this? It's, it's, it's really all about this. Uh, again, um, I know this is true. Luke would, uh, or Peter rather, would refer to those orders from Jesus over in Acts 10 and 42. He would say that the, the Lord ordered us, 10 and 42, to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Okay? So, so, so what he's referring to in verse 2 of chapter 1 of Acts are the orders to fulfill the Great Commission as the apostles, okay? Again, just, just make the connection with me. The orders to love the community by, 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 by leading them to the Savior, the One, the Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, okay? And so this, this, this is good. It begs the question, and so how, how did they do that? That's what I'm trying to get us to see here. So how did they fulfill the commission? How did they love the community? All right? Um, side note for just a second. We, we are not, i got to be careful with this. Um, 
We're not loving the community if we're not proclaiming to the community that Jesus is the one. Okay, we're not. We're not best loving this community if, if we're not proclaiming to this community that Jesus is the one. This is what this is all about. Now, 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 it might be very easy for me to deny that or to reject that. I just encourage you, read, read Acts. Read what, what Peter is saying in Acts. These are hard messages. Okay, it's hard, but he's proclaiming to this community and to this world that you're lost apart from Jesus. Okay? And so that's why I would say we, we, we must accompany all of our church activities with this mission, with this message making much of God, okay, making much of him, and then, and then letting this world know that without God, through Jesus, there's, you're lost, okay? Um, stories about this. Um, I had a friend named Lawrence. Um, I think of Lawrence as probably the first guy I ever got serious about reaching. You know, some of y'all have that person. Where, where it got real to you. Like, um, I was a new teacher at uh, R.T. Fisher, and he was uh, a teacher down the hall from me. And he was a real just, uh, honestly, he was a big buff guy, and he was kind of like a bulldog of a guy. Like, the kids were scared of him, you know? But me and Lawrence just connected. And so I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start trying to um, glorify God with Lawrence. And I'll never forget, Lawrence and I had some, like, not, like, some back and forth that people had to, like, come in and say, hey, are y'all all right? You know, like, that was Lawrence's and I's. If, if, if you don't know me, I can get intense. <laughs> um, and I was worse years ago. Um, yeah. And so I'll never forget one time Lawrence, he looked at me with his big bulldog demeanor, and he said, you have an ulterior motive in your friendship with me. It's, 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 it's all about you just trying to convert me. And, 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 and I remember um, it took me back for a moment, and perhaps, you know, um, I was very immature, maybe. I, 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 don't, I, I like to think whatever, but I remember looking at Lawrence, and I said, Lawrence, I, absolute, I don't like the word ulterior. That sounds sneaky. But Lawrence, I don't have a sneaky motive with you. I have a, a very obvious motive with you. Yes, I want you to know Jesus. Yes, I do. I want you to know this God that is real to me and, and, and a Savior that is alive. You know, I want you to know this. And so um, we do so much, you know. But if it's not about making much of God, and if it's not about proclaiming to this community that Jesus is the one, then church, how are we different than just a civic group? How are we different from a community club? There's a lot of good organizations that do a lot of good things, and a lot of them better and, and more reaching and more organized than the church. What makes us different? The guy whose name is on our sign. The coolest savior there is. The coolest friend you could ever have. I'm, I'm convinced when Jesus walked into the room, people were happy that guy was around. You know, some of them, <laughs> some of them, like the ones that, that wanted hope and wanted healing and wanted friendship. When he came around, they were glad that dude showed up. You know, what? that's what makes us different. Look, that's heavy and it's hard and it challenges me. So how do I make everything like didn't Jesus say give a cup of cold water and when you came and did this you love me? Yes, I know this. So it's heavy and it's hard for me to figure out how in my life to make it all about Jesus, to make my service about Jesus. No kidding. I'm driving here a minute ago. It's pouring rain. There's a girl that's riding her bicycle. I didn't know it was a girl. There's a person riding a bicycle in the pouring rain. I stop and roll down the window. I say, are you all right? And her dad comes running out. And I said, whoa, 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 I'm not a weirdo. I'm just, I see somebody riding a bike in the rain, and I'm thinking, are you okay? Dad didn't say a thing. So uh, do you not help people in the rain? I don't know. Like, this is hard. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like, this is hard. Um, I'm not saying quit your job. Maybe some of you need to. I'm not saying change your career or don't go to college. I'm not saying that. Maybe some of you need to. But what I am saying, we got to wrestle and figure out how to make this life about our Savior. We do. If we're going to follow him. You know what? 
And so maybe, just maybe, that's why we see the apostles in the earliest church, the very first example of them corporately doing something, maybe that's why we see them devoting their self continually to, guess what? Prayer. God, help us figure out how to do this. Help us figure out how to do this thing that Jesus ordered. Help us figure out how to fulfill this mission. Help us. I'm not making it up. So, verse 12 of chapter 1, Acts. They returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. When they had entered the city, this is verse 13, when they entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, and then you got all the apostles, minus Judas, of course. Look at verse 14. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to what? Prayer. They were praying about that mission. They were praying about those orders. They were praying about loving and reaching a community. They were praying about it continually in devoted prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. There's about 120 of them, the next verse says. How many in this room? I don't know. Maybe about that many? I don't know. And do and, and you see what takes place next? A really big important thing takes place next. Peter is, is inspired with boldness to stand up and fulfill the prophecies of old and say, you know what? The prophecy said that there was going to be one of us that denied our friend and Lord Jesus the Christ, and now we've got to replace him. And maybe, just maybe, because they had prayed about it so hard and so much with continual devotion, he felt empowered by the Spirit of God to say it's time to do that. It's time to find a guy to step up and help fulfill this mission, to bear witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's where you get the story of them praying and Matthias is selected, right? How did it start? Prayer. It started with prayer. Is that the normal? Is that the Old Union Church of Christ normal? Is that the Portland Church of Christ normal? We want to start an activity. We want to start a ministry. We want to do a whatever. Do we pray and pray and pray? I'm not making this up. So we, we make much of Acts 2, right? Yes, we do. We make much of Acts 2. But we kind of cherry pick it. Forgive me. I don't preach here, so I can say that, right? We kind of cherry pick it a little bit. Of, of the things that characterized the early church, it was more than just being baptized for the remission of sins. That's huge and it's important. I just preached that a minute ago. But it was more. Let's make just as much of what we see in 41 and 42, okay? Those who, were, who received his word, you see that? That's how I preached earlier. The, the, the Spirit of God is received. What's the next thing? The, the, the text says they were baptized. There were added about 3,000 souls. And this is what characterized them. They continually were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to what? To what? Prayer. Prayer. Devoting themselves to prayer. <clears throat> When, when I see that devotion to prayer, this is what I then see. I see some awesome things happen. Do you, do you notice this? L literally, verse 43, everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and wonders and signs were taking place to the apostles. All those who believed were together. They had all things in common. They began selling their property, their possessions. They were sharing them with all and anyone who might have need. What's going on there? Can, 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 can I rightly call that community love is going on there? Can I? Am I is that stretching, Sam? <laughs> Sam says no. I see the beard shaking. <laughs> right? Day by day, continually with one mind in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God, having favor with the people. And the, the Lord was what the, the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So, so if I'm not mistaken, we have this, this formula. We have this example for, like, church growth. That's a big one for us, isn't it? We take that seriously. We want to figure out how to fill this room, right? We, we have this example here. You know what I'm tired of? 
Can I be real with you? I've been being real with you. I'm going to keep being real with you. You know what I'm tired of? I'm tired of us out teaching, unteaching what we see here. You know what I mean by that? I'm tired of us excusing it away. I'm tired of us saying, well, there's some reason why that's different then than it is now. I'm tired of that. I, I, I'll, I'll just be honest with you. I'm tired of that. Um, there's a guy that, that I love. I'll get a biscuit with him uh, Friday morning. He's going to a preaching school. I won't tell you which one, but I care about it. It means a lot to me. And uh, he came one day and he said, I had a professor tell me that Acts 2 only took place because all the people were traveling to Jerusalem and it's way different then than it was now and yada, yada, yada. And I wanted to... No, brother. Does it have to be that different? Does it? You tell me. Argue with me. I don't know. We can talk about that behind closed doors or whatever. Like, I'm tired of us just excusing Acts 2 away. It's saying it's different then than it is now. I'm tired of that. Unteaching it, out teaching it, over teaching it, under teaching it, whatever. I'm tired of that. Let me tell you this. So what I see in Acts 2 is a church that was characterized by response, the baptism, the devotion to the apostles' teaching, by fellowship, by the breaking of bread, and to prayer. That's what I see. And I see them being described as that, being characterized as that. Have you ever considered how does Portland characterize this church? You ever considered that? That happens all the time at Old Union. Isn't it neat how the speaker speaks and like phones just start talking, the word? Like, that's cool. It happens all the time, brother. It is okay. Um, back, back with me, though. Back with me. I say stuff like this at church a lot. When, when Gallatin, Castain Springs community thinks Old Union, what do they think? They think rock building on a hill? Or do they think like devotion to the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer? When Portland community, I don't know, you guys tell me, when Portland community thinks Portland Church of Christ, what do they think? You, you know, I don't. Do they think awesome parade floats at the Strawberry Festival? I don't know. Like, you tell me, what do they think? Do they think devotion to the Word of God? Do they think fellowship? Do they think breaking of bread? And do they think that is a church that prays? Is that what they think? Because that's what I see in, in the text. Is it not what you see with me? Okay? Be challenged with me. I love you, right? I love you. I love you. I want to do this. <laughs> right? I want to do this. I believe this. Believe it. I believe it so much that when I don't see it, I get discouraged. And I have to take a break. I don't mean that to be critical of anybody. I just say I just, I want this. So what do they see? So, sometimes I think that our biggest obstacle to community love is that we only want to love people or reach people as much as we can stay comfortable. Does that make sense? Sometimes I think our biggest obstacle to community love is that we only want to reach people or love people as much as it's comfortable for us, as much as we can maintain the church that we're comfortable in. And, 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 and what I see here is radical allegiance, radical acceptance of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God that changes who we are. Church, it changes us. That's what I see. I'm convinced the early church changed the world, listen now, because they welcomed the Spirit of God to completely change them. One more time. I'm convinced that the early church changed the world because they welcomed the Spirit of God to completely change them. Completely. It takes a, ra a radically changed heart to pray the words that I'm about to show you. Okay? And we'll wrap up. So I told you, Acts, about four chapters, right? And so what I see in this prayer that I'm about to show you, this prayer of prayers, if you will, is, is our, our radically changed hearts, hearts transformed by the Spirit is what I see. Let me try to build this. Let me try to set this up, and we'll shut it down. So this is Acts 4, probably one of my favorite chapters in all the New Testament, guys. I don't say that lightly. This is a good one. 
And so Peter and John had been arrested, okay? Again, they are hardcore fulfilling these orders of Jesus. They had been arrested. And while they were on trial, they dared call Jesus of Nazareth the Christ. And that's a really big deal. I say that exactly like that. Peter and John, they are daring to say, yes, Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ of God. And this is bold. Let me tell you why. Because they are saying that to a, to, to a room of individuals who were the same guys that looked at Jesus of Nazareth and said, we, Stephen paraphrased, we dare you to say that you're the Son of God. We dare you to say that you're the Christ. Who are you? Just, you, you better not say it. Jesus was real awesome. So cool. He'd say, I, 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 I am who they say I am. I am who you say I am. I am him. I, I am the Christ. Caiaphas would say, you've heard it from your own ears. Let's kill him. This is the scene in Matthew. Luke records it too, where Peter is outside of some kind of structure. He's looking in and he sees what they're doing to Jesus. This is the same scene where Peter says, I don't know that guy. I don't know that guy. I don't know that guy. You remember that? Same scene. Now, now, get into Acts with me. Bible's cool. No story like it. Bible's cool. So here in this scene, right, Peter is standing in front of those guys who were saying that to Jesus. And here he has the opportunity to be bold. And man, he builds it up. He builds it up. This is why you see the language that you see. We know a lot of this language. Look here with me in Acts 4. Peter, this is verse 8. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people. I, and uh, before I go there, look at verse 7. So you, you see what they're doing here? They placed Peter and John in the center of themselves and they began to inquire, By what power and in what name have you done this? Peter and them have healed a guy, by the way. So you tell me what name you're doing this. It's almost like, I dare you. I dare you. you. You were there. You know what happens. You know what we did to this guy. I dare you to say his name. Look at what Peter says. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, you see he's building up here. Oh, here we go. Let it be known to all of you, to all the people of Israel, by, by the name of who? Jesus Christ the Nazarene whom you crucified, God raised him from the dead. By this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by <clears throat> you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. There is salvation in no other name. We know this part. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Peter makes no bones about it. It's the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. He is the Savior. He is the one, the chief cornerstone, the one whom you crucified. Guys, this is so good. This is so good that these chief priests, Caiaphas and all these guys, they can't say anything. Keep reading. It's an awesome story. There's nothing like it. They say they were amazed because of Peter's boldness. Because Peter knows what happens to people who name the name of Jesus. They were amazed. You keep reading the chapter, and these guys, Caiaphas and these uh, chief priests and elders and leaders, they say, well, look here. We can't really say anything or do anything to you because the people have seen a miracle. We've seen a miracle too, actually. So this is what we'll do, Sam. Just stop saying the name of Jesus. That makes me laugh every time when I read it. Just quit saying his name. Please. They didn't, I don't know if they said that, but just stop saying his name. And then you get that next famous line by Peter. Y'all know it, right? Verse 19, whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than uh, to give heed to you rather than God, you be the judge. We cannot stop speaking what we've seen and heard. Chief priests, elders, then they can't do nothing. Oh, it's so awesome. So this is what I'm getting to. This is what Peter and John do. They run back to their companions. Who are their companions? The church. Right? They run back to their companions. This is what they do. Verse 24. When they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord. What's that mean? When we lift our voice to God in one accord, what are we doing? We're praying. And this is what they pray. Oh Lord, 
It is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Man, we get to pray to that God. Do you love that with me? We get to pray to that God. I say, God, if you can calm the waters and the seas and bring order to the chaos, then you can bring peace to my heart. You can do that. Lord, it's you who made heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things and the kings of earth took their stand? And the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. This is a statement of God's sovereignty. Here they all are. All, they're, they're all stacked up against you, God. All, the rulers of earth, the kings of earth, they're all stacked up against you. The Gentiles stood up against you and took their stand. He says, and truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you appointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and even the peoples of Israel. I love this next line. Do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Hey, guys, God is sovereign. He's sovereign. If there is a word or a description of God that has changed my life and has changed my faith, it's God's sovereignty. Take that with you. Just take it home with you and love it and search it and seek it. God, the sovereignty of God. He is powerful to do all things. From him, what? And through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to just give your lives a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. God's sovereignty. Take it home with you. It's what Peter and John are praying here. The Gentiles stand up and rage. The kingdoms of earth rage, right? They do all these things that we don't understand. And guess what? It's all according to your predestined and ordained plan. And I don't understand that, Sam. There's a lot of people that argue about the predestination and sovereignty of God, and then they refuse our free will. I don't go that far. I put it together. It's mysterious to me. I don't understand it, and I'll stop talking about it. But I'm telling you, it's changed everything for me. God's sovereignty. Check it out. That's the prayer here. And now, verse 29, take note of their threats and grant that your slaves speak your words with confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. What are they praying about? Help us speak with boldness. Help us to love this community. To love them by fulfilling this mission, by showing this world that Jesus is the resurrected Savior. He is the way, the only way to the God of heaven. There is no other name under heaven by which man can be saved except by the name of Jesus. Amen. Give us boldness to do that. That's what they're praying. And what happens, verse 31, when they had what? Prayed. The place where they had gathered was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak the word of God with boldness. You want to love this community? Then you pray to God for it. And you pray and you pray and you pray and you let that characterize this congregation. Elders, leaders, I, I, I know you're in here. I love you dearly. I do. I, I, I love you. Do you lead this congregation in prayer? Is prayer a staple of this congregation? Do you pray about the hard things? Do you pray more than you make Sean talk? Do you pray more than you let this guy talk? Do you pray? Do you pray? Do you pray? I'm no authority for how to love this community. But I have prayed that if there's anything tangible you take from these words tonight is that you will pray. And you know what? You can measure that when I leave. If it meant nothing, so be it. Don't change a thing. But if it means anything, then be people of prayer. Yeah, have, you, have you tuned out? Have I spent my time? Is it, is it over? Yeah. I, I get you. I, I know how it is. I, I get tired of sitting. I tell people I probably preach because I don't like listening to people. <laughs> so, w tangible. Uh, they say give the lesson legs. There's all kinds of problems in our community. 
Pray about Portland um, helping with a problem. We're, we're tempted as congregations to do everything, to be everything, to have our hands in everything. I don't know if that's the way. I don't know. What may be a better way is to pray for access to this community through its deepest and darkest problem. And so, do, Does that make sense? So you pray for access to this community through its deepest and darkest problem. God, reveal to us the way to best reach this community. What is it? What is it? You know, there's a huge drug problem in our community. And that's dirty. And it's hard. And oftentimes you don't get to see results. I know it hits home for you. It does. I know it does. Huge problem. About uh, uh, 2018, I'm sitting in my office. I, I hesitate to say any of this if it becomes about me. This is not about me. I... Um, God has pushed me into jail and addiction ministry. He's pushed me into it. That's, how, that's the only way I can describe it. I'm sitting in my office. It's 2018. I'm studying for Wednesday night class in some capacity. And I get a knock on the door. And a guy says, hey, you got some time this afternoon. It's Grant Carey. Some of y'all know Grant. He says, why don't you come to the jail with me? You know what? I'm honestly thinking, no, nah, because I got to study to preach a lesson, Sam. So, No. Okay, thank you, Spirit, for slapping me in the face. Yeah, Grant, I'll go with you. An hour later, I hear a cell slam behind me. First time anything like that had ever, I'd never been arrested. First time I'd ever been in a jail in my life, and I wasn't scared a bit. I wasn't scared. There are 60 people in Tower 1 D-Pod looking at me thinking, what is this tucked-in shirt, white boy, clean-cut back then doing in this cell with us? I didn't belong there. The only reason I'm there is because of Jesus. He's it. I wasn't scared. And I knew in that moment, there's something about me that can do this. You know what? And so, I won't tell y'all the whole story, but three years later, I'm, 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 I'm standing in an old farmhouse with a team of about 16 people that I love, and we're holding hands and we're praying and we're singing, y'all know the song, Oceans? We're singing, God, you call me out on the water, the great unknown where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. We had stepped out onto the water into addiction ministry, and we had opened a home for recovery. Praise God. And it's dirty, and it's uncomfortable, and it hurts, and you don't get a lot of, you don't get a lot of uh, um, reward from it, but sometimes you do. Sometimes you do. So about four months ago, a guy named Steve sitting on a park bench these are his letters plus a few more. This is the most recent one. I don't do this for me at all. It's not me. I was not in that jail because of me. I wouldn't have been there, Sam. This is from my friend Steve. Hey, brother. I hope you're feeling better. I had COVID. I can't begin to thank you enough for being there for me and basically saving my life. I mean, how does a man thank a man enough Thank you for reminding me that there is no one who loves me, that there is one who loves me no matter what. And his love outshines anyone's. You've got a special place in heaven, brother, waiting just for you and others like you. Thanks also for believing in me when I didn't even believe in myself and for letting me know that I was someone that someone could love. I thought I was scum and that I was unlovable. But because of you and the members of Old Union, I hope y'all are listening tonight. They've not heard this letter yet. I now know that I am capable of being loved, not only by humans, but by Jesus himself. And again, you and the members of Old Union are to thank for that. Because of y'all, I can look in the mirror and not cringe. Well, I'll close for now, but y'all will forever be in my heart and in my prayers can't wait to hear you preach the gospel again, brother. 
So hurry up and get well. I'm praying that you and your family have a great and safe trip. Thanks again. Love your brother, Steve. God calls me every day. So you've been on the royal law, right? I, I, I really am closing. Um, royal law. Fulfill the royal law by loving your neighbor as yourself. If you do that, you're doing well. But if you show partiality, you're committing sin and you're convicted by the law as transgressors. Four years ago, I would have said, Steve, you're an addict, and I don't have time for that. God changes us. He changes our hearts. He changes who we are. He changes how we see people. The royal law in that text is really all about the opposite of us being partial. You remember how I said sometimes I think we only want to reach the community as much as we can stay comfortable? Y'all want to reach the community? You pray about getting dirty and getting uncomfortable, doing things that may not be your normal. I'm convinced there is a world out there of sinners who are dying like Steve. And they need the church of Jesus Christ. That's what they need. Um, I got this dog. I had a dog named Gus. Had him for 14 years. I loved old Gus. It's kind of a sore topic, to be honest with you. He just came up missing one day. I'm visiting this older woman who I love dearly, and I'm sitting with her there in her backyard, and there came this, these two dogs running across her backyard, and I'm about 20 miles from my home, and one of those dogs looked just like Gus. And I'm talking to this old woman, Sam, and it is so unlike me to be like, hold up, that's my dog. And so I, I took off, like, because I thought it was my dog. And would you know it, that dog that I thought was my dog didn't want anything to do with me. He ran off in a cornfield. But that second little, like, mutt dog that was running with him, he just wouldn't leave me alone. Wouldn't leave me alone. And he was running up to that elderly woman, wouldn't leave her alone. She had to go inside. And I found myself thinking, get away from me. I didn't even want you, like... Oh, man, it hit me like a ton of bricks a few weeks after that. It hit me when Steve, one day I'm taking him home, and he said, man, you're my best friend. And I couldn't help but think, you know, I've spent a lot of my life with the eyes that wanted the kind of people that I wanted, you know, that would chase after the kind of people that were comfortable and like me and would fit in with our church, you know. Oftentimes, it's those people, they didn't want anything to do with my God or my Savior or even me. They'd run off in the cornfield, you know. How many people are just begging for this hope that we have? They're begging for it. And we don't have eyes for them. Let's pray about those eyes. For eyes that change, for hearts that are open, for ways that we can access this community and love this community. It starts by praying. Will you do that? Pray with me. God of heaven and earth and sky who takes chaos and establishes refuge and peace who has the power to, to take all of my pain and just to help me and free me we, we, we pray to you with words that we know we praise you with words that we don't know we just praise you and, and we pray for eyes that see the community, for hearts that are open, for, for boldness and power to be your people and to fulfill the orders of our King Jesus and to not let anything get in the way, rulers and principalities, the kings of earth, whatever, our traditions, our comforts. Father, we pray for those obstacles to be moved and for us to see the people who want you and who need you. Help us, I pray, for Stephen, for Old Union, 
for Portland. Father, help us to see as your son sees. I know that I am imperfect, but you are perfect. May this congregation in its wholeness see you tonight in this message. And may they be transformed as needed to your image. God, we love you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you.